Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bow Valley Nonprofit Speaker Series. Just going to give people a couple minutes to get logged in here before we get started. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you've got your lunches ready. All right, we'll just give people a couple more seconds here to get into the Zoom webinar. All right, so hello everyone and welcome to the Bow Valley Nonprofit Speaker Series. If you're looking for ways to connect, check out the Bow Valley Nonprofit Facebook page and also check out the discussion forum on the Bow Valley Nonprofit website. The Bow Valley is located in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot, the Tsutsina, and the Stony, no Stony Nakoda First Nations, Métis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in this Treaty 7 region. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping tips. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And um, we'll also have a, a question and answer session with Jenny at the end of her presentation. So make sure you stick around for that. And um, at the end of the webinar, there's gonna be a short um, survey. If you could please fill that in. And if you miss that, we'll also send it out by email. That really helps inform future sessions. A huge thank you to Tara and Ruth from the FCSS at the towns of Camor and Banff for making this speaker series possible. Let's welcome Jenny Spur. Jenny is a communications strategist and public relations professional based in Canmore. She loves working with the community and has over a decade of experience managing communications campaigns, coordinating media events, and building community partnerships. She's lived and worked in the Bow Valley since 2014 and most recently served as Director of Communications at FAMP Center for Arts and Creativity. Jenny founded Perch Communications in 2020 to help small businesses and nonprofits rise above their competition through a combination of communication strategy, media outreach, and public relations. My name is Moselle Dibden, and I'll be moderating the questions today. Now let's welcome Jenny. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here today and uh, to share with you some tips that create for creating a communications plan that uh, works for you. I was really happy to see several uh, familiar names uh, here today, but for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Jenny Spur, and as Moselle said, I'm the founder of Perch Communications here in Canmore, which is on Treaty 7 territory. As a communication strategist and a PR professional, I have dedicated my career to helping public and nonprofit organizations create meaningful relationships with their audiences and communicate their messages more clearly and consistently. Trust me, I have seen it all when it comes to communications planning. I understand the unique challenges of working in an industry with limited time, resources, and multiple roles to fill. I also understand the importance of maximizing your message to create the biggest impact in the communities you serve and the causes you care about. In my first role, which was in community development at Canadian Blood Services, I had a campaign budget of $50. <laughs> Imagine trying to convince 800 people to donate blood with $50. Well, I did it, and that was over a little over 10 years ago. Uh, since then, I've learned a lot about what works and uh, what doesn't work for organizations that are local, regional, and national in scope. And I founded Perch in 2020 to share my experience and help uh, small businesses and nonprofits rise above their uh, competition. So now I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Um, some folks have already started to introduce themselves in the chat box. If you haven't yet, please take a few moments. Tell us your name, uh, your company, and one thing you are hoping to learn today. We have Alana from the Bamp Food Rescue. Hi and welcome, Alana. Uh, oh, Ruth says hello uh, from the town of Banff. Christy 
is with the Wolfpack Warriors and Christy Wolf Photography. And we have Marion Walls from Santa's Anonymous. Hello, Marion. Thank you for joining us today. Sarah is here from the Kenmore Museum. Christy from the Banff Kenmore Community Foundation. We have Naomi uh, from Masquachis Cultural College. Oh, and McKinney Psychological Services. Great. And Teresa from Canmore Community Housing. This is really fantastic. Thank you all for taking the time to introduce yourselves. And don't forget to mention one thing you're hoping to walk away with today. We have Carrie and Denise and Moselle, coordinator for the Bow Valley Nonprofits. She's looking forward to learning more about pitching. Awesome. Yes, we're definitely going to cover that. Uh, Yuka from the Co Kitchen Commercial Kitchen Rental Space. Very cool. Thank you for being here today. Ruth mentions that elevator pitching was something we heard about from groups, and that is definitely something that we're going to cover later on in the presentation. It's such an important part of being able to uh, communicate your message with impact. And Teresa, presence on Facebook, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna talk about ways you can share your message with your audience across multiple channels, including social media. <laughs> yes, that's right. Not that we share elevators at the moment, Ruth. <laughs> Okay, so we'll get started here. Uh, what I'd love to know is where you're at in the communications planning process. Now, I know for some, creating a communications plan can feel like a journey and taking that first step might seem completely overwhelming. For others, putting a plan you already have into use on the daily might be the challenge itself. Um, but don't worry, I got you. No matter where you are on the path to creating a communications plan for your organization, I am confident you'll walk away with something valuable today. So our first poll question, uh, does your organization have a communications plan? And uh, you can go ahead and answer here. Your options are, I know my organization needs a plan, but I don't know where to start. I've heard we have a plan, but I don't know where it is or how to use it. My organization has a plan, but we aren't using it as effectively as we could be. And the last one, what's a communications plan? <laughs> now, I'll just take a moment for our results to come up. But in the meantime, a nice reminder from Christy to make sure that in your chat, uh, you are sharing with panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments. Okay, so the results are up. Does your organization have a communications plan? All right, okay. So we're pretty evenly split. 40% uh, of you saying you know your organization needs a plan, but aren't sure where to start. 50% saying my organization has a plan, but we aren't using it as effectively as we could be. And 10% saying what's a communications plan. And thank you all for sharing. Like I said, uh, today, I'm confident no matter where you are in your planning journey, you're gonna walk away with some some information that'll help. So here's the thing, having a communications plan can do more than keep your communications activities organized and on track. Done well, a plan can help you time your activities better, engage your community more effectively, and share your stories with more impact. But there's more. So I put together a quick list of the 10 benefits of an effective communications plan. Here they are. Uh, helps employees understand the overall business strategy, helps you to build trust in the workplace, create a sense of teamwork among employees because everybody knows the direction that you're going in, give your employees the knowledge and tools to meet expectations of their job, develop engaging content and strong impact stories, build community around your brand, raise your brand's profile, uh, refine your image in the community over time, increase conversions and meet your business goals, and make the most of your time and resources. Now, if that doesn't convince you that you need one, <laughs> here's what we're going to talk about today. Over the next 60 minutes, we're going to walk through the essential components of a communications plan, including how to segment your audience and strategically target your communication based on their needs, how to create your key messages and articulate them clearly and consistently, how to optimize your workflow with a bird's eye view of every communications piece your team is planning, 
and how to pitch your nonprofit in 20 seconds or less. So let's get started. Throughout the presentation, we'll use the following case study as our guide. So here's the situation. The community of Canmore Kananaskis is at a crossroads. Uh, for those of you who live here, you know the community is growing quickly. Once a humble mining town, it's now a celebrated international tourist destination. As the town continues to grow, many community members and elected officials are turning their attention to developing a sustainable tourism strategy. Tourism Canmore Kananaskis engaged uh, my friend Scribe National, who then hired me at Perch Communications to develop a communication strategy that would reposition Tourism Canmore Kananaskis as a trusted voice in conversations about the future of tourism in our community. So together we developed a strategy that would meet three goals. The first one, to help residents understand the importance of tourism in Canmore Kananaskis. Next, to build confidence in Tourism Kananaskis, uh, Tourism Canmore Kananaskis as the destination marketing organization for the region. And to invite ongoing collaboration, resulting in more memberships. So as we'll discuss, knowing your goals is key to strategic communications planning. Now, uh, for those of you who said, what's a communications plan? Here's a simple explanation uh, boiled down to its basic point. Um, a communications plan is a detailed outline of how you will connect your small business or your nonprofit with the people who are interested in or affected by your products or services. So uh, when I talk about communications activities, I'm talking about things like uh, sending out newsletters, uh, creating blog posts for your website, posting on social media, sending out press releases if you're engaged in PR activities. Really, it's any type of touch point that you have with your public. And how you choose to communicate with your stakeholders will depend on your business goals. Generally, there are three types of goals that pertain to nonprofits. The first one is awareness. The more people who know about your organization and brand, the more potential funders, donors, and volunteers you have access to. The next one is funding. Uh, charitable organizations and nonprofits rely on financial support from institutions and individuals who share similar values and interests. And the last one is volunteers. Now you need to share messaging that incites people to volunteer their time for your cause. Now I've included here on the screen some uh, tangible ways that you can achieve these goals um, using the SMART model, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. So you'll see for awareness, we talk about increasing the number of visits to your website by a certain percentage each quarter. Funding, increasing the number of donors on your prospect list, again, by a certain percentage um, in a specific time frame. And volunteers to improve the volunteer retention rate by a certain percentage year over year. Okay, so now we have our next poll. Uh, the question is, what are your organization's needs? What are you hoping to achieve through your strategic communications? And based on the, what we've heard in the previous slide, I've included some options here. We have increased brand awareness, reach more potential donors, recruit more volunteers, all of the above, or something else entirely uh, in which you can share in the chat. So go ahead and uh, put your answers in now. Great, okay, thanks everyone. So increasing brand awareness, um, it comes in at 20%, reaching more potential donors, 10%, recruiting more volunteers, 10%, all of the above. I'm not surprised by that at all. Comes in at 40%, uh, the response with the highest percentage of votes there. And 20% uh, uh, have others 
So let's take a look here. Ruth says, reaching target audience kind of awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Making those direct connections with your target audience is so important and something we'll talk about here, Ruth. And Teresa, yeah, social media presence, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great goal. And one, one that's common to everyone, I'm sure. Okay, so the key is to turn your goals into something tangible. Um, the SMART model can help with that. And I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this acronym, but if not, um, here we go. SMART goals are specific, meaning they focus on a specific area for improvement, measurable, they establish benchmarks to measure progress, assignable or actionable, um, so they specify who will do it, realistic, they're realistic about what results you can achieve, and time specific, they set a deadline uh, for when the results are to be achieved. And oftentimes when we're looking at goals that may seem lofty or out of reach, like building brand awareness, it helps to think about how we can break it down into smaller, more actionable goals. Um, I think of them as baby steps as we work towards the summit, right? Um, so start to think about things that you can achieve in a realistic, time-specific, actionable way that will slowly work you towards your overall goal. Now, I'm going to share an unpopular opinion with you, and don't tell my colleagues in the communications industry, since this is what they tend to base their businesses on, myself included. You don't need another 12-page document that gathers dust on a shelf. <laughs> a communications plan should be short and concise. It should be a dynamic, living document that your team can put into use every single day. And it's so easy to get bogged down in the planning process and end up with 30, 40 pages of information that's all well and good, but what do you actually do with that? Um, my recommendation to everyone is to always condense that down. One page, two pages, or better yet, create a communications calendar that I'm about to show you uh, later in the presentation to make that into something that's actionable. Now, I promise you effective and realistic strategies to start planning your communications activities. So here they are. Step one, segment your audience. Once you've determined your goals, the first step in creating an effective communications plan is segmenting your audience. This means defining who your audience is, and it allows you to tailor your messaging to meet their needs and increase the impact of your stories. So some sample audiences include donors, both current and prospective, government representatives, board members, staff, clients, partner organizations. You want to get to know who you're talking to by gathering information and data about each audience. You can consider both uh, relevant demographics, which would be the statistical information like age, location, gender, et cetera, and psychographics which are lifestyle assumptions like values, opinions, attitudes, interests, etc. Then customize your messaging to answer some of their biggest questions. In many ways, it can help to create audience personas. Um, these are fictional characters that represent each of your target audiences. You can have a little bit of fun with it. Um, give them a name, an age, an occupation, and a superhero-like backstory because why not? Um, then refer back to them when you're thinking about your messaging. Here's an example from the earlier case study. Uh, so, meet Mike. Here's what Mike thinks. My wife and I came to Canmore in the 80s. It was a different time then. The town was much smaller, a stop on the way to bigger destinations. We remember shopping at Mara's grocery store and always being able to find a parking spot downtown. We remember late nights at the Canmore Hotel. Since then, we've watched this town grow into a bustling metropolis. I'm sure some of it's recognizable, but with so much development, we can't help but long for simpler times. My wife and I wanna see a long-term sustainable tourism strategy implemented in this town before an influx of tourists take away everything we know and love about it. Now, of course, a lot of this is based on assumptions uh, that we've developed, you know, based on 
um, demographics and psychographics. But you can see how having a better understanding of this person's needs and desires uh, helps to tailor your messaging and make it more effective in the long run. Uh, remember, you're not communicating to everyone. Not everyone is interested in what you have to say. And if they are, they're not interested in hearing it the same way. So that's why it's important to segment your audience um, and create messaging that really resonates with them so that they hear it. Now, in marketing and communications, we talk about the buyer's journey. Uh, this is the process that buyers take to become aware of, consider, evaluate, and decide to purchase a new product or service. It's not unlike the donor cycle, which I'm assuming many of you are aware of. When thinking about donors as your audience, you can maximize your message by meeting them where they at, they're at in the cycle. So in a nutshell, that means you have to plan to make your ask at the right time after you've built a relationship. Now, I've combined the two models for comparison's sake, and it looks something like this. Uh, step one, awareness or identification. So the buyer or donor has identified a problem, need, or cause they're passionate about, and they're looking for information and resources to better understand it. At this point, they are in an information gathering state. That means they're not ready to make a decision. So your communications should provide upfront value without commitment or sales pressure. A good example is an informative blog post or social media post on the cause you serve and why it's important. Step two is consideration or qualification. The buyer or the donor understands the problem. Uh, they are researching all of the available approaches to solving it. They want to learn more about the ways they can contribute. This isn't necessarily about dollars yet, more about impact. So at this point, they're trying to make the best decision possible. And your communications should provide tons of value, showcase your expertise, giving them a glimpse into the benefit you bring to the community you serve. So now would be a good time to share impact stories. Uh, the next step is step three, um, decision or cultivation. The buyer or the donor has decided on their approach. They're now compiling a list of available vendors. So at this point, they're looking for information on why they should choose you and choose to support your non nonprofit specifically. So your communication should show how you've helped the community you serve and direct people to ways that they can get involved. The last step is loyalty or stewardship. So the buyer or donor has made their decision. At this point, they wanna feel good about the decision they've made and supported throughout the process. So your communication should thank them for their gift, highlight its impact, provide regular updates. Think like donor spotlight videos or interviews. Now the ideal mix of communications should include all of these points because uh, you want to meet people where they are, and not everyone is at the same stage at the same time. So when you're creating your communications calendar, you can include tools and tactics that cover each of these four areas, um, trying not to focus on one too heavily, too specifically. I feel like that was a lot. So I'm going to stop here for a moment to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so go ahead and uh, pop them in the chat. Could be about anything we've covered so far, including what is a communications plan, uh, goal setting, segmenting your audience, or uh, what I just covered, understanding the buyer's journey slash donor cycle.
Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I can do that, Ruth. Uh, Ruth is asking for short examples of these four areas with the Tourism Canmore case. Um, yes, bear with me as I put my thinking cap on because I didn't have those at the ready. Um, okay, so I'm going to focus on one of the goals yeah, thanks, Ruth. Uh, I'm going to focus on one of our goals, which was to increase membership. Um, so as the destination marketing organization for the region, Tourism Canmore Kananaskis is funded by member organizations who contribute a certain amount, thereby increasing the amount of marketing spend that the DMO has to promote the region to global markets. Um, one of the challenges that we faced was that um, member organizations have their own marketing budgets. Um, they're doing their own work in the communities or they're partnering with other organizations to market their businesses and didn't necessarily see the value of partnering with um, TCK, with Tourism Canmore Kananaskis. So, um, you know, what we did right off the bat was try to show ways that um, tourism specifically and uh, the, the work that Tourism Canmore Kananaskis was doing in our community to draw tourists to our town was impacting and benefiting the community as a whole. So that would probably be um, stage one. Um, stage two, consideration, qualification. Uh, this is when we tried to create more awareness of who was actually running the organization now. So building out profiles of the staff um, and letting people know more about their expertise and uh, what they bring to the table and can offer in terms of marketing. Um, stage three, decision cultivation. This is raising awareness of the different membership options that are available to people and uh, how there's um, different funding available, different funding models available that they could subscribe to. And then loyalty stewardship was drawing attention to their businesses after the fact, once they've joined, um, making sure that we're highlighting and profiling different businesses on all of our channels um, to make sure that they feel welcome and appreciated and part of the TCK team. <laughs> okay, <laughs> are there any other questions about any of this? Oh, great question. Uh, how often should a communications plan be updated? I believe that a communications plan is a living document and it should be used daily. Um, that being said, I would recommend probably, depending on your campaign, the length of your campaign and the work that you're trying to do, at a minimum quarterly. Um, if you can, ah, Good question, Christy. Um, asking about a time frame for a comms plan monthly, quarterly, annually. Um, it, it's really dependent on your goals and what you're trying to achieve. If you have a specific campaign in mind, campaign goal in mind, um, I would say at the very least you'll want to look back quarterly. So make sure that you're checking the measurables from your plan, reflecting on whether those are uh, helping you and achieve your in achieving your goals and where you are in achieving them, and then adjusting things accordingly accordingly. Um, monthly works great if it's a time-specific shorter campaign or project-specific campaign. Um, and if you're looking at a larger organizational institutional-wide plan, then annually is great too. Just make sure to be checking in frequently on your measurables. Yeah, fair point. Um, okay, great. So let's continue. Uh, the next element of an effective communications plan is key messaging. Now, key messages are the main points you want your audience to hear and remember. And it's only through regular consistent use that they really start to sink in. So your plan should have no more than five key messages. For each one, try to focus on the impact your organization has in the community you serve and how you help your audience overcome their struggles. You'll also want to answer who you are, what you do, why you exist, and how people can get involved. And at least one of your key messages should be a call to action that moves people through the donor cycle or the buyer's journey. 
So when I think about my key messages, I like to start with overarching themes that summarize the biggest benefits to working with a nonprofit. And then I get more specific by adding in proof points that back each claim. Here's an example from the Tourism Canmore case study. So our main overarching theme for this specific key message was, when the tourism sector prospers, we all prosper. A bit of an explanation, our work and the work of so many local businesses directly and indirectly benefits our community by attracting visitors year round, providing jobs, driving revenue and economic investment, and enhancing quality of life for Canmore Kananaskis residents. The specific proof points, tourism is the primary driver of economic activity in Canmore Kananaskis. Tourism in Canmore Kananaskis supports over 4,000 jobs year round and attracts 11,000 daily visitors who contribute over $345 million directly to the Canmore economy annually. So you can see how it gets more focused in its structure. I like to do this for every key message in a communications plan. Having your key messages at the ready can also help you with pitching your organization in a pinch. Now, a former coworker of mine always said, uh, tell it to me in a tweet, meaning you have 280 characters or about 20 seconds to wow me. And when the clock is ticking, you don't have time to be timid. An elevator pitch is a quick way to introduce your nonprofit to the people you meet. It should be short and snappy and above all else, strategic. Now here are the elements of a good elevator pitch. It should have an objective, what you're trying to achieve um, from the person you're pitching. You might not have this information at the ready. Sometimes you have to draw on context clues to help you decide what's most appropriate. Um, and it can help by the, to look at uh, where you're at, if you happen to run into someone at a conference or a networking event, uh, the topic of that event, um, and uh, how your organization is related to that. Your unique selling proposition. So this is the benefit that you bring to the cause you care about in the community that you serve. Uh, the services that you provide. And now the caveat here is only if they're relevant to what you're trying to achieve um, when talking to this specific person. Don't rattle off a ton, just one or two that will really resonate. And a call to action. How can they keep the conversation going? And then practice your pitch until it rolls off the tongue and you'll be ready when the time comes. Now, the third element of an effective communications plan is tactics. These are the tools that you'll use to reach your target audience. Tactics can be divided into two streams, channels and content. Channels include things like email, newsletters, blog posts, social media, media relations, etc. Whereas content includes things like storytelling, infographics, impact stories, etc. Think of it like this. Content is the thing that you're sharing and channel is the place where you're sharing it. And remember, the goal is to connect with your audience and establish your nonprofit as a leader in your industry. So don't flounder on a bunch of channels that you can't maintain consistently, specifically with regards to social media. You don't need to be present on every social media channel, only the ones where you're target audience is most active and most engaged. That way you'll soar on a specific few channels that will give you the reach and results you want. Now, I told you earlier that you don't need another 12 page document that sits on your shelf and gathers dust. The most important part of creating a communications plan that works for your nonprofit is putting it into a shareable calendar. If much of what we've covered lives in your head and you don't have time to write a big plan, put it straight into the calendar. If you have a plan, take what you need and put it in the calendar. Now, I prefer Google Docs because it allows for easy sharing and real-time collaboration, but some folks have trouble accessing it without a Gmail account. 
So uh, whatever platform you decide to use, make sure it's in a location that everyone on your team can access. As for format, Excel works best for what I'm about to show you. So I've put together a template uh, that we will walk through now. And after the presentation, you'll all have access to this template um, to use in your own communications planning. We'll just take a second here to bring that up for you. Great, okay, perfect. So everyone should be able to see this now. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just hop over. Perfect, okay. So um, these are the column headings that you can include in your communications plan. The first one is content. Uh, what type of communication is it? And we've talked about this. It could be a blog post that highlights an important cause. It could be an email newsletter that you're sending out. Um, it could be a piece of content that you're sharing on your social media channels. Whatever it is, just put a description here. Um, and you can use this in a way that works for your team. So it might be as simple as saying blog post. It might have to include the title of the blog post. Uh, you might also want to put in a link. Um, whatever, again, makes the most sense for your team. The next one is channel. Where is it being published? It could be that uh, you're publishing this on your blog. It could be going on LinkedIn. It could be Facebook. Um, it could be any multiple number of channels. What I like to uh, encourage people to consider is a hub and spoke model where um, your communications materials live on one place, say your website, that's the hub, um, and you have spokes that feed off of that. So then you're sharing that piece of content or communication from your website on your social media channels to your subscribers through your newsletter um, or on, you know, any other type of blog, whether or any other type of publication, whether that's like an annual report or report to the community, whatever it might be. Uh, the next one is target audience. So who is it intended for? Now we talked about our target audiences before. Um, they could be, you know, donors, government representatives, community partners. Uh, having an understanding of who you are targeting this specific piece of communications to, make sure that you are doing it in the most effective and efficient way. Next is buyer's journey stage. So where are these folks in the buyer's journey or in the donor cycle? Um, having a drop down menu here is very helpful so that you can quickly select where they're at, uh, which allows you to target your communication even more. Next is key message. So what is the main point you want them to hear? And remember, when we're thinking about key messaging, we often talk about what we want people to know, think, and do. Um, so that's an important way that you can, uh, important and quick way that you can structure your key messaging to have the most impact. Next is goal. So what is your objective for this piece? How does it contribute to your larger goals? Um, if it's about building brand awareness, you can put that there. If it's about recruiting volunteers, you can put that there. Um, that will inform the next column, which is the call to action. What is the next step? So uh, if, for example, you are recruiting volunteers, their next step is probably to register. Uh, so make sure that, that it's clear to everyone on your team how you want people to move through that journey and what you want them to do next by including a call to action here. Timing, when is this piece being published? And there's a lot to consider with regards to timing um, and it can be, a lot easier to plan if you think about key events and milestones that are happening in your project planning. Um, make sure that the information you have is going out at the appropriate time uh, for your audience. 
The final piece is responsibility. Who is the team member responsible for publishing it? And it's important here to actually assign a name. Now you can use drop down menus to limit your choices to the items that you've identified in your plan. Creating and sharing your communications plan in this way can keep everyone on your team flying in the same direction. Just remember to check in once in a while, like I said, at least quarterly to evaluate your progress and adjust your approach. Now, as I mentioned, you'll all get a link to this document after the presentation. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay, so just one second here. Okay, so um, there you have it, folks. Uh, we covered a lot in this quick 45 minutes. Um, if you have questions and would like to chat about how your company from benefit can benefit from a communications plan, please feel free to get in touch with me directly. Uh, you can book a free 30-minute consultation by sending me an email or getting in touch on social media. Uh, but I'm going to stick around for the next 15-20 uh, minutes today to answer any questions that you might have about the presentation. So please feel free to pop your questions into the chat now. Ruth, do you have any examples of elevator pitches you could share after or no? Yes, absolutely. I can send those out to you folks. But generally, you know, it looks something like, like this. Uh, you know, my name is Jenny. I'm the founder of Perch Communications. It's a boutique storytelling and communications company uh, based in Canmore. We help nonprofit organizations communicate more clearly with their audiences. And I'd love to talk to you more about how we might help you connect with the people that you care about. I can send out more after though. Um, Christy, tips on getting your board to invest in communications. Uh, yeah, that's a challenge. <laughs> that can sometimes be a challenging one. Um, I guess what I would say to that is, is the proof is in the pudding. So um, if you can show real and tangible ways that um, communications planning or having a structured uh, designated communications team member might help to meet the board's strategic plan in addition to your own communications or, or goals, um, that can really help. Yeah, data, exactly, Christy. Yeah, <laughs> so important and you can't argue with the numbers once they're presented to you. Um, I, I also find to linking it, like I said, to the strategic plan, the strategic direction of the organization is also very helpful um, just to show that you're all working towards the same goals with the same intent. Hey Jenny, I have a question. Do you uh, recommend any other communication planning tools or software? Yeah, so there are tons of different tools out there that uh, you can use. Um, things like, you know, Basecamp or Asana or, um, oh, I'm totally blanking on it. <laughs> but there's, lot, there's lots out there. Slack, that's the one. Um, there's lots out there. Uh, and what each of them comes with uh, specific benefits and drawbacks that, you know, you'd have to consider in choosing what works for your team. I use Google. I use Google Docs for everything because of its ability to um, collaborate in real time. I also find that Google works really, Google Docs work really well because they use a format that most people are comfortable with. They mimic Word and they mimic Excel. So generally people have an understanding of how to use those formats. Um, it's also free. <laughs> yeah, which makes a big difference uh, to your bottom line. 
So, you know, I would say explore a few, see what works for your team and um, consider all of your needs. But yeah, I, I like Excel. Keep it simple. So that's what you use kind of for project management as well? Yep, absolutely. Oh, great. Yeah. I saw there was a question about sending out the PDF of the presentation. Absolutely, we'll be sending an email out to everyone who's been registered um, with that information. Um, I do have another question. Um, this feels a bit overwhelming for some people, I, I suppose, especially the smaller nonprofits that maybe don't have staff on board. Could you recommend some easy ways to start planning communications? For someone yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mazelle. So um, one of the things that I like to recommend to people to is to start simple. So, uh, you know, looking at this communications calendar, maybe start by thinking about some of the key holidays that are coming up, right? Christmas, Easter, Ramadan, whatever, um, and input those into your calendar. Think about what you want to say to people at those specific times. Um, and you'll notice how quickly your calendar fills up. There's all kinds of days, important days of recognition that you can add in there. Um, from there, I would layer in specific projects or campaigns. So if you know that, say, you submit your annual report in September um, and you share that with your donors and stakeholders, then you, know, you can put that in as a milestone too. Um, things like reports to the community, you know, other, other points of engagement that you ha know happen annually, just plug those in. Um, and then you can get project specific. So if you're starting, say, a capital campaign uh, on a specific time, you know that you can put that into your plan, um, both at the start and at the end of that campaign, and then start to sprinkle in the milestones from there. So, you know, start, start basic would be my recommendation. Okay, so Naomi says, do you have any social media calendar suggestions? Those days of recognition, are there some ready-made calendars? Yeah, Sister's Day, National Dog Day, et cetera. I'm not aware of any that are ready-made. Um, that unfortunately takes a good bit of research off the hop. Um, but once you have those in, generally, you know, they repeat annually. So it's something that you should be able to duplicate pretty easily. Uh, Moselle, do you know of any? Um, I see Ruth just added a note that uh, Bow Valley Immigration Partnership has a diversity calendar available on their website with uh, over 60 countries and cultures in the, in the valley. So that's a really great place to start. And I guess the, the neat thing uh, also for organizations that have a, a smaller capacity is, is that that calendar can be renewed each year, right? Jenny, they can kind of use that as a template almost uh, and then repopulate their campaigns or, or anything that's changed that year. Yeah, absolutely. You're so right. And I, and I find too, it fills up quickly when you start to think about all of the different audiences that you have. So um, for example, if you're sending out or sharing your annual report and you want to share that with donors, you want to share that with government and you want to share that with the public, that's three lines in your calendar right there because each of them is going to be hearing a different message in a different type of way. Um, so it populates pretty quickly once you get into it. Does anyone else have any other questions? Feel free to pop them in the box there. And thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge with us today, Jenny. It's been a real pleasure to hear everything that you've, you've got to share. I, I really enjoyed the, the local case study as well. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. I definitely think that um, as Bow Valley residents, we're familiar with what's going on in regards to tourism. So it's nice to see that there is some work going on in this area. Absolutely. See, Ruth's got a question. Are there ways Bow Valley nonprofits can help each other with this area? Uh, any interest in offering a working session? Yeah, so if anyone's got any interest in being involved in kind of a, a session on this, perhaps um, sharing information, giving feedback, that kind of thing, feel free to email uh, Bow Valley nonprofits. It's uh, uh, Bow Valley nonprofits at Gmail. Um, and I'll be sending an email out which you can reply to as well. We'd love to hear from you if you have certain thoughts around this or certain ways that we could build capacity or help one another. Um, definitely send it through and I'll forward it to the ladies at the towns. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. Really appreciate your time and all your insights. That was really, really fantastic. Um, and I just wanted to let everyone know to please save the date. Um, in August, the, uh, the third uh, Tuesday in August, we'll be joined by Kathy Irvine from Watershed Organizational Development Group, who's going to talk about the value of collaboration. So I think that's going to be a really fun session and, and really well timed with all the different projects and initiatives that are going on in the Valley right now. And then she's going to be holding the session in September as well on strategic planning. So I think that's going to be a, a one that you want to register for. Um, it's going to be a really important session. But thank you so much, Jenny. Really appreciate your time and all your insights today. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.